Good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's good. Yes. Um, have you received my email with the indications for the exams? Yes. Okay. Then obviously we can uh, we can, we'll discuss this. If there are any doubts, so we can uh, discuss this. Uh, at the end of the lesson or anyhow you send me an email. Um, <clears throat> what, um, Excuse me, I don't know why I'm trying to I'm, I'm not sure understand why it. the system as usual. I'm not sure how it's working here. Mm -hmm. um, professor, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, it's Chloe Anzalone speaking. Uh, I didn't receive any email. Yes, I'll I'll be sending the Erasmus okay. students. I'll be sending separate, uh, separate instructions for the exams. Okay, okay, I'll be sending okay. them today or tomorrow. Sorry, I just uh, I sent the uh, Global Legal Studies, the Italian students, their instructions, and I will send them that more or less the same, except for the sort of some um, practical. In further information which is in the which will be in the sheet of paper that I'll be sending you between today and tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also also kid, yes yeah, sorry, I just apologize. I've sent them the instructions only to Italian students, not to um, our Erasmus students. So uh, I'll be uh, I repeat I'll be sending them uh, very soon and so you two will have uh, um, the instructions. Now, just let me, uh, what we were doing, uh, seeing yesterday was more or less uh, um, sort of what has, how comparative law has developed, what were the main ideas in the 19th and 20th century the idea of the uh, civil law, common law divide, the fact that these are two different ways of organizing the legal systems and very different and therefore this uh, world apart from these two systems and uh, uh, secondly uh, sort of the idea that uh, uh, codes are typical aspect of uh, um, sort of continental European and of civil law systems and therefore everything is in a code and Therefore, the code is the idea that somehow some kind of uh, computer program, you press a certain key, uh, a key on the keyboard and out comes a decision. You press article so and so and out comes a decision, which is a, a pretty um, sort of a childish view of seeing uh, how codification works, actually how it has worked and is working. And then we've seen also the fact of so legal families, this idea of, of putting together, um, grouping uh, legal systems according to some kind of families of various kinds of, uh, uh, according to certain uh, characteristics, religious, political, historical, and so on. Now, uh, what we'll do, we'll go on with analyzing uh, um, aspects of uh, uh, sort of Western legal systems and trying to somehow compare them with other uh, systems. And here, I'll, I'll go back to the slides. Um, one second. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, just one second. Just let me go back to, I'm trying to understand why I don't have my, um, I don't see my, yes, okay. Um, now, just to remind, this is sort of very simple, but makes uh, uh, the whole difference between the Western legal systems and other systems, which I will use, quote, legal, unquote, 
just to point out that it's it's different. So the idea that this is has to do with what we mean by West, uh, and the idea that the, the system, the legal system, is based on uh, the idea that the individual is at the center of the legal scenes, and therefore rules and are built around the individual, and therefore it has to do with the, um, with the relationship that <laughs> has with power. Sorry, someone has their sorry, someone has their microphone open. Can you please? Thanks. Someone has their microphone open. Sorry. I don't I don't see I think it's um, Marianne with me. Sorry, can you please close your microphone? Oh. I hope that they don't say anything that is um, that is compromising. Well, okay, I've I've closed that and then just okay. Just let me get back to my slides. Uh, so the idea that the uh, system, the legal system, is built around the individual, and the individual is at the center of the legal scene. Uh, obviously, it's not only the individual, but we also we focus on the idea that individuals are important, and the law is made for individuals, not individuals for the law. At least this is the general idea and this therefore we have rights, individual rights, fundamental rights, subjective rights, but it's always referred to the individual. And the second element, this idea of justice, which is obviously very uh, sort of um, has a, a philosophical and ethical uh, dimension this idea of justice, but we see that the legal system is not only a uh, a series of rules, but it has, uh, at the end, it has an issue of justice. And we can talk of substantive justice, we can talk of um, procedural justice, we can talk of uh, um, formal justice, uh, but anyhow, the idea of justice, however we decline it, it is a central idea in our, in our legal system. And so, uh, just, just to point out that this is what makes, uh, from our point of view, as we are Westerners, this makes a legal system. Uh, so, but uh, as we are doing comparative uh, legal systems, we are trying to compare systems, well, we must be know that uh, this notion of, uh, of uh, individual, of the individual at the center of the legal scene and of the idea of justice is the result of uh, the origin of the Western world and the of evolution of its civilization. So if they are different values and a different development, well, this brings a different organization of society. So the whole idea is law is not simply uh, put out for some transcendent reason, we shall see it in a moment, uh, but it is, the law uh, is set to organize society in the best way, possible way. So just to point out, this is very important. So we see the law is functional to a well-ordered society in which certain values are um, uh, uh, affirmed, enhanced, protected. Um, clearly, if that in a society, historically, there have been, there's been a different development of values. Obviously, this will bring to a different organization of society. Just to point out, these are quite very obvious uh, remarks, 
but we must keep them in mind when we start looking outside. Otherwise, we just think that as everybody uh, drinks Coca-Cola and drinks and, and goes to McDonald's as soon as it will be possible to go to McDonald's, well, the whole world is the same. We have the same consumption habits. No, the fact that people consume and go around in a car when they go and eat certain things or they listen to a certain music doesn't mean that the sort of the system, society is the same and the legal system is the same. Now, just to point out, I've just, uh, as I've mentioned from the beginning, what we have focused on in this, uh, uh, in this class is uh, introduction to comparative legal systems of the Western legal tradition. So I've always clear that we're talking of the Western legal tradition. Uh, I haven't analyzed um, one could do it, but it, I think it is rather complex, especially for first year students. Uh, we could look outside, but um, I will just use a couple of examples just to show you how uh, it is not easy for us Westerners to approach non-Western uh, systems because we have a certain view of the world and we think that the world is all the same around us, whether we go to China or we go to Saudi Arabia, whether we go to uh, Indonesia or we go uh, to um, some uh, island in the Pacific, well, it's all the same, it's one small world. No, things are, it is a global world, but things are, uh, different, especially from a legal point of view. Uh, so just make, uh, I just wanted to make uh, an, a couple of examples. The first is what is commonly known as Islamic law. Now I'll put the term law between uh, brackets because uh, um, it, uh, well, uh, our idea of law is a certain idea and uh, According to the Islamic tradition, well, it's not exactly the same thing. Just to point out that things change. We can call it uh, in the same way, but they're not exactly the same thing. So first point is to take into account when we look in so-called Islamic law, that this is a series of uh, religious precepts. And they come from the Quran, they come from Sunnah, and they come from other uh, sources, various and rather dispersed sources that started way back when, uh, sort of the eighth century. So it goes back and hasn't, they have, things haven't changed very much. Why? Because they're religious precepts. And therefore religion is transcendent, and therefore there's no reason why a religion should change. I mean. Religion is not an automobile, a, a computer program, or um, um, uh, some kind of garment. Well, there's no reason why, theological reason, why religion should change. There's, no, there's written nowhere. As a matter of fact, one, one would imagine that religions don't really, shouldn't really change, because if they change, well, they're no longer religion. I mean, whether we look, if we look at the three monotheistic uh, religions, which are all connected one uh, with the other, Judaism, Christianism, and, uh, and uh, uh, Islam, they're all connected. They have the same uh, God, uh, although the, the divinity is defined in a different way. But uh, the, sort of when we look at the, uh, Islamic law, we see that it is substantially the, the essential elements of it are set uh, well uh, 12 centuries, 11, 12 centuries ago, and they haven't changed much. Why? Because they are religious precepts, and there's, so there's no reason for changing them. Just, uh, I mean, if we one looks at Christianity and one imagines well, what were huge uh, so sort of discussions that in the first centuries of Christianity they were on certain theological aspects. Once those were defined, but that's it. And so if you don't change them uh, overnight and say, oh, but, you know, I think this we we should revise our religion. It makes no sense. I mean, 
for uh, believer, for those who believe, it doesn't make much sense saying, oh, but we're going to change the religion. It is not like that. Things don't, in religion, they do not work like that. Whatever religion we are talking about, whether the religion is in the sort of in the Mediterranean uh, area or the Western world, or we are talking of other areas, India, uh, China, Japan, or other parts of the world. Just to point out that this is, uh, this is the very important aspect. The second point is that uh, if we look at the term, when we talk of Islamic law, we use an Arabic word, Sharia, which means the road. Sharia is the road. So it's uh, uh, the road, obviously the road is straight. This is the path which leads you. Where does it lead you? It leads you, obviously, to behave properly. You don't move out of the road. That is the path, the road that has been written in the, in the uh, sacred write writings and what is the, the interpretation of these writings. And they bring you to uh, sort of... Uh, uh, these are the rules that the true believer must follow to, uh, in order to receive uh, the transcendent reward. So it, it's not, it's not, hasn't do, hasn't got to do with so much with organization of society. I mean, if we look at the, how the Sharia is, it isn't organized like, it's our point of view, a legal system. But we find in the sacred writings of Islam, we find a whole lot of principles that to our Western eyes appear to be mandatory binding rules. However, first of all, they're religious precepts and therefore apply only to the believers, the true believers in Islam. I mean, now it's, uh, it's Ramadan time and, uh, and if someone is not, uh, uh, is not a, a Muslim in a, um, in a in a Islamic country. Well, that person is not bound by Ramadan. Ramadan means fasting from uh, dawn to dusk. Uh, well, obviously, will not go around eating during the day because this would be somehow offensive towards Muslims. But surely, if the person is at home, that person can has no reason to fast and and can eat normally just as uh, uh, that person does every day. So as you see, the idea that this rule, that the fact that for 40 days, Muslims should have, uh, should have uh, uh, sort of uh, this, uh, this period of fasting, which is something quite common. We find this also in Judaism and Christianism, at least in different ways, but anyhow, it various forms more or more less stringent once upon a time in Christianity during Lent it was much more strictly imposed but now it is uh, substantially is very relaxed but anyhow uh, you can see there's a rule it's a religious rule that only those who are believe in who are, who are Muslims have to have to follow so just to show you that fact that this is not um, somehow a rule that uh, uh, it has religious reasons and that's it. They, it becomes uh, 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 an obligation, a legal obligation, when the uh, sort of this uh, is a rule that all the community must follow. Some kind of uh, impositions, uh, set by some authority which imposes that particular rule just let's imagine veil the islamic veil so but this is a secondary aspect so when we look at uh islamic law well uh, we see a whole lot of religious precepts which we can find in the talmud for uh Jews or in the gospel or in the uh, or in other sacred writings uh, uh, for um, for Christians, but clearly we are talking of something quite different in our Western eyes. Over the last at least two centuries, we have clearly separated the religious sphere from the 
uh, secular sphere, and therefore what belongs to God belongs to God, and what belongs to Caesar belongs to Caesar. So there are two different uh, systems. So just to point out that uh, um, when we are talking of Islamic law, already we find it difficult for us Westerners, although we may know Arabic, we know may have lived there, we, but it is difficult for us Westerners to understand this very particular aspect, which is related to, it is a religious uh, moment, and it is not a legal moment. Then we have throughout the centuries, we have, we see that there are a great deal of uh, uh, Islamic lawyers who are very fanciful, and if one wants to see how uh, we find it already in the 10th century, uh, Islamic lawyers who are very, uh, had a way of, of outskirting uh, uh, sort of religious precepts and somehow getting to a certain result while formally uh, respecting uh, those religious, uh, religious rules. Uh, this shows a great deal of uh, uh, ingenuity and of ability, of logical ability on how to uh, somehow, on the one hand, respect uh, religion, but at the same time have uh, um, bring together certain, uh, certain very practical and economic results. But uh, it is very clearly very different when we're talking of law in the Western world, we're talking of law, we are talking of something that is set by the state or by an authorized uh, institution which can produce, which is the source of the law. And here instead we are talking of religion, which is different, which has a different scope and completely different, which and probably much more uh, sort of important because it's transcendent, but it, there are two different aspects. So we, just to point out that we are, uh, it, it, we just can't say, oh, but let's, let's compare Sharia with, uh, uh, with what happens in, in, in Europe. No, it's, it makes no sense. We could compare religious precepts that we find in Islam with religious precepts that we find in, in the holy books of, uh, of Christianity or in other books of Judaism. Uh, we can compare religious rules and that, but this is, we're not talking about comparing legal systems. We are comparing religions, and which is a very important aspect, very interesting, but we're doing something that is different from what we're trying to do in this class. Comparing legal systems, which is not comparing religions, uh, which I repeat is very interesting, extremely interesting and uh, fascinating, but it is something, uh, something different. So this is the first element I would like to uh, transfer to you. The second one is, let's see if I can get the slide. Uh, so, we have to distinguish between what are the religious precepts and the state law. Uh, just to point out that Islamic law is different from the law of the Islamic state, because there's a certain amount of confusion, this idea that, you know, you go to, well, when it is Morocco or uh, Kuwait, or you go to uh, Turkey, or you go to uh, Pakistan, and, uh, well, one says uh, that is Islamic law. Nah. To a certain extent, obviously it influences. Just like uh, mm, uh, rules of, uh, of uh, Christianity have influenced the legal systems of the Western tradition uh, whole, significantly under many aspects, in family law, in certain uh, ways of organizing society. Uh, but the fact that these countries, in these countries, the majority of the population is Muslim, does not mean that the Islamic law, Sharia, uh, in its, which is variously interpreted according to uh, sort of, the, the, the sort of how, how, 
the country you are because you find uh, you find um, Islam is from well China Philippines Indonesia Indonesia is the biggest uh, um, uh, Muslim country in the world uh, and it goes well obviously to Morocco Mauritania and then it goes from uh, from uh, Zanzibar uh, in Africa up to up to Sarajevo uh, to Bosnia just to point out that so the expansion and so the idea of how Islam is interpreted in these various parts of the world how Sharia is interpreted well it depends it's not interpreted in the same way but anyhow um, it is uh, uh, in a country where the majority of the population is Muslim this doesn't mean that you know the only source of the law is uh, is uh, is Sharia. There's a whole lot of uh, of regulation of rules that have nothing to do with religious precepts. Like, isn't that the sort of uh, traffic lights in 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 Pakistan or in uh, in Saudi Arabia somehow commanded by some uh, sacred writing which establishes how uh, traffic lights should be ready? So and made a rather stupid example, but just to point out that the, um, the fact that the, in a state uh, a great number of citizens are of the uh, majority of the population is Muslim does not mean that uh, uh, Sharia is the main, the only, and the dominant source of the law. Take, for example, the sort of the principle of the idea that the sort of fine we Westerners find repeatedly the idea that any uh, man, uh, Muslim, can have uh, a certain amount of wives. And then we go around and we go around sort of the Muslim world uh, and we discover that, well, only some of Saudi Arabia and some of the countries of the Gulf countries, this is actually in the law, but all the rest of, the, of, of Muslim. Uh, countries, countries where the majority of the population is Muslim, well, it is, the, or the law just prohibits this, or the law doesn't really somehow, somehow shuns this kind of uh, polygamy. So just to point out that, so just to show that it is, uh, well, we Westerners, we must also not have cliches, not have this idea, this idea that has passed and passed to us through uh, novels, books, uh, or um, films, uh, and hearsay have a rather sort of deformed idea of how um, how uh, the organization of society is in certain countries. So, just to point out that again. We, when we as Westerners, we look at this uh, uh, phenomenon which we call Islamic law, uh, well, uh, we realize that our system is very special as compared to another system. And this does not mean that we have, it's better or worse. It just seems that it's, it's different. It's not the same thing because we are very, very secular. And we have the idea that we have the law is for this life, and we are not interested, or at least uh, many citizens, the majority of citizens, think that the law is for this life. And then, if they are, if they are believers, they, are, they have a faith in a religion. Well, they will follow certain precepts, and they are perfectly allowed to do this. But these spheres are different. So just to point out that the, uh, this is a good element, this comparison with Islamic law shows what we mean by a legal system, which is typically Muslim. Now let's take another example, Ch so-called Chinese law. Uh, um, as you know, China has been strengths of China. Why China is so strong? Because it has a history which is more or less 5,000 years old, and it is Substantially, China has been uh, an empire, um, a country, a huge country, which has been kept together over, well, 
many thousands of years. Things have changed, rules have changed, uh, but substantially they have, um, China has been China for uh, thousands of years. This is not common to all uh, empires. I mean, we know everything about the Egyptian empire, but the Egyptian empire was dissolved well, more or less the sort of um, second century, well, first second century, uh, century after Christ until the end was occupied by the Romans and that was the end of the Egyptian empire. We have nothing when we go to Egypt. We see these wonderful monuments, but we, there's nothing left of that. Egyptian empire. Right here we have continuity, continuity which is given also by the fact that it's written, it is a, a, a civilization that invented writing uh, well very early and has a very important uh, and therefore it can trace its history. So when we look at Chinese law, quote unquote Chinese law, well we see that there's a very uh, a historical conflict between uh, what the Chinese call Li and Fa. Li is the tradition, rights, uh, where you behave towards your other people or you behave in the community, and then Fa is the order which is set by whoever's in command, historically the emperor, and therefore, and is enforced in a very strict way. And we find that in the history, in Chinese history, we find uh, a great deal of importance of uh, um, uh, sort of moments where tradition is stronger and other moments in which the command, the role of the authority is much stronger. But Clearly here we see that the, or we Westerners who like to sort of organize a legal system in a certain way, well, we sort of, we understand the power, we don't really understand me, or rather we try to put this in so-called social norms, but it's something completely different. The idea, there's a complete, there's a philosophy behind it, the idea that sort of, uh, an individual should not uh, uh, should not disturb the uh, harmony of the world. Should not uh, should not disrupt dis make disorder in society and in the world. And every body and everything from stones, trees, and animals and people have their role in the universe, and, and that is their role that they have. So, uh, and we find this somehow also quite a lot also in, in India, this idea that everybody has his or her place and, and this, this is how society should, well-ordered societies, not made of individual rights in which everybody says, I have this right, but instead it is community, it is a community that is in peace and that everybody is, uh, in good terms with uh, his or her neighbor, and there's no uh, envy and no uh, of crimes of criminal activity. And if there's no order, then the, uh, the, the authority uh, steps in and very fiercely imposes uh, its law. So just to point out, this is something that is very, very different from our Western uh, Western ideas. So uh, when we look at uh, these different traditions from ours, we should try to so-called exchange places. Now let's imagine there's a Chinese, not some Chinese who've gone who studied in Europe uh, or in the US and has been educated to Western, uh, to Western somehow uh, culture but someone who has always studied in China, knows everything about the history of China, and suddenly comes to Europe and looks at Europe or the US with Chinese eyes. Obviously, it would see things in a very different way than we see things. So just to point out that the eyes with which we look at the systems 
Well, we are inevitably influenced by our tradition, our background, and this is not only personally, but it goes back thousands of years, the way we see the world, which is not exactly the same way as other people that have come from uh, different civilizations look at the world, and they look at it somehow uh, different. So it is uh, uh, we Westerners put the center of the legal scene, individuals, persons, and justice, and this is not um, sort of uh, uh, not the same elsewhere. And then when we try to say, oh, but you should do this, well, uh, other people from other countries resent this, this attitude and say, well, but this is your tradition. Why are you imposing uh, your tradition? Make a rather uh, silly example, as if uh, sort of we were imposing Chinese and Chinese to eat with a knife and a fork, and uh, or they were Chinese were imposing us to eat with chopsticks. I mean, obviously the legal, the idea of law is slightly different than, than uh, sort of knives and forks and chopsticks. But the, this gives you the idea that when you have a tradition, a certain tradition, which is not something that is uh, uh, sort of recent, that has gone over for thousands of years, well, you can't, it's rather difficult to change people's minds, isn't really, and not very difficult, but then it's not useful to change people's minds. One should instead understand that there's diversity, and this diversity in a, in a complex and global world, well, it, it is enriches the world, and there's no reason why everybody should do the same things, have the same head as if they were somehow computer programs. Um, just to point out that this is just to show if we start as Westerners, we start looking at uh, Islamic law, or we could look at also Indian law, or at the Chinese law and Japanese law, well, we realize how particular and unique our notion of law is in compared with what we Westerners imagine the law is elsewhere. So this is just to um, just to show you how how this is something that's quite common and that is increasing. I'm just what I'm raising this topic because it is increasing uh, in throughout these decades. We've devoted our great part of first lessons to the idea of value. What are our values? We've seen sort of the, the U.S. Bill of Rights, the French Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, and then uh, the constitutionalism, the, the first leg of the Constitution devoted to fundamental rights. Uh, and after the Second World War, we had this uh, great um, sort of um, giving great importance to human rights. We've seen the UN. Uh, the Declaration, Universal Declaration of the Human Rights and then other uh, human rights uh, charters. And, but we realize, if we look at them, if we take, we move back one step and we see it, this is full of sort of a catalog of rights which are set by Western standards. We, Westerners, uh, um, have seen what happened in the Second World War, and we have created a catalog of, um, of uh, human rights which we feel are fundamental and that should not be uh, violated. However, this catalog is influenced by uh, Western standards, which are obviously to our, our eyes are not only appropriate, but they are very, very, very important. Uh, however, when we start moving and we're trying to export and, and ask other countries to follow these human rights, especially if these countries come from, have very um, long history behind them, China is a typical example, 
uh, well, here we have uh, certain uh, conflicts, of which are theoretical conflicts, that then come into uh, fall into practice. For example, our Western view of individual and fundamental rights uh, versus the power of the state. So Chinese say, well, listen, I mean, have you tried, I mean, well, it's wonderful, uh, you know, keep in order in Luxembourg. How many are you in Luxembourg? Oh, less than one million. Now listen, uh, for us in China, Taiwan with less than one million inhabitants is really a, a village. Our towns are generally 10 million onwards higher, and we are 1 billion and a half. Now, how are we going to keep or have an orderly society when you have 1 billion and a half uh, inhabitants? Um, shall we say, well, individual and fundamental rights to 1 billion and a half, or should we instead have a strong state? Just to point out, this is, this is the argument I'm I'm just repeating a typical argument that Chinese, um, anybody who is uh, studies political science and, uh, or even a, a lawyer in China, well, says, listen, we can't apply, uh, China is not Luxembourg, it's not Switzerland, it's not Italy, it isn't Germany, it isn't, it's, a, it's something huge country and it is much more complex to apply these principles. Principle of equality, so the idea is we are all equal. And this is fundamental. I mean, we've seen this how this is being developed from at least, at least from the 16th century, uh, the idea of um, all men are created equal. Then more men, women know, but I mean, eventually uh, with the uh, the end of the 19th century, the Westerners understood that maybe also women are equal to men and they should have the same rights uh, as men. But just to point out the very slow evolution. So now we, we stress the idea of equality under the law, equal rights under the law, and instead we have the very important uh, Civilizations, which from China or, or India, which think that well, um, society is not based on equality and it is based on an orderly role of classes and separation of sexes. I mean, obviously, to us Westerners, uh, we challenge that and we say this is not appropriate for us. But if someone says sorry very much. This is how we are developing our society, and this is how we want our society. I mean, it, it is very difficult, complex to say, oh, but mm, you are against fundamental human rights. I mean, you realize when you see that uh, a sort of society is organized in a certain way, and it's a very long tradition in this, it's not some dictator, crazy dictator that comes out, wakes up one morning and says, oh, I'm going to subdivide the society in classes, and obviously women on one side, men on the other, and different uh, legal status for, uh, for uh, each sex. I mean, this is, uh, it is one of the complex issues that in a globalized world we must face. And again, the idea of the person, which is central to the Western idea, was community. So in certain parts of the world, the community is the most important. It's not the individual. We're not interested in the individual, or rather, much less. It's we are interested in the community, in peace in the community, and the well being of the community. And if someone is not personally, is not feeling very happy, well, this person can move, can go somewhere else. But the, what we are centered on is the well being of the community, not the well being of the individual. And uh, obviously, Western legal tradition means democracy. We've seen we the people set in the, uh, in the U.S. Constitution, and so this is for us Westerners is fundamental. I mean, if you are not uh, a democracy, well, we start discussing: Are you really?
following what the Western legal tradition has taught us. But if we go elsewhere, well, people, we find uh, countries and we find very big countries, we say, well, democracy, okay, that's fine, it's a very nice theoretical issue, but what we're more concerned about, so we're not interested in telling people how people vote and see how much importance we've been given to voting systems. What, we are, what people are interested in is not putting their preference in a, in a ballot box. They are what they're interested in is receiving basic social services, health, education, uh, transport, minimum salary, uh, welfare. This is what they're interested in. They're not interested in voting. They, for them, it doesn't make, uh, uh, in our tradition, they say, uh, well, it's not the problem of who's been elected there, here or there. What citizens are expecting is that the government, whoever is in power, should provide these services. And so it's what, called, what is called an output uh, system. So we look at the output. We're not looking at the input, the fact that you go and you vote and then this parliament that, that is, represents all the citizens and then this is debate, discussion. No, this is considered quite immaterial, quite irrelevant. It's just a procedural aspect that has no importance. What is important is what is delivered, not is how you somehow you designate your leading your institution. And again, just to show these conflicts when we start looking from the, we go outside the Western uh, legal tradition and we go in the rest of the world, we have a tendency towards universalism, this idea, a universal declaration of human rights. So these principles are universal. They should apply in Samoa as they apply in Washington, D.C. They should apply in Buenos Aires as they apply in, in Peking. But it's, uh, uh, this is our Western view, while uh, other parts of the world, they say it's differentiation, different, different civilizations, different histories, and well, uh, universalism is just uh, why is it your universalism? How would you take it if we set universal principles and we establish it? Our principles are Chinese, Japanese, Indian, or Saudi Arabian uh, principles are universal. You wouldn't like it very much. You wouldn't like these principles to be uh, imposed on you. So just to point out that this is, again, one of these um, uh, conflicts. So just to point out that um, um, in this uh, um, sort of when we start going outside our Western legal tradition, where there are many differences, we've seen these differences, we understand that comparing legal systems is first of all trying to find law. What do other, in other systems, do they mean by law? And at the same time, well, uh, we see clearly what are the leading features, what keeps the Western legal tradition together, and what makes it different from other, other traditions. So just to show you these, these aspects, and I just was uh, um, um, I would just do a short stop and uh, as usual. Any questions on this on this first part? See if I'm just looking at the messages. Dominic Antonio says no.
Okay. And if this is sufficiently clear, we can And let's move back to our slides. Now, uh, so just to point out that the, uh, clearly legal issues are all complex. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be going to university if it was so intuitive and anybody can understand legal problems well. Uh, you wouldn't have to study them and you wouldn't need to go take a, a law degree. Uh, and so just to show the complexity and that when we, you are, especially you are, uh, I mean, you will be living in the, uh, in the 21st uh, uh, millennials that will be living in 21st century in a global world. Well, it is important that you manage to understand that uh, um, there's there are differences, and these differences must uh, be uh, one must understand the reasons of these differences and, and um, adapt yourself to these differences. As simple as that. It's not that these differences are dramatically so dramatically different. Obviously, they can be moments of conflict, but uh, obviously, but these are uh, sort of in any um, in any society in any world we have moments of conflict in the pathology, but generally it has, um, uh, we find, uh, uh, we find that there is uh, somehow a way of getting things done, even between different civilizations and different cultures and different, even in troubled uh, times. Now, let's try to look at uh, what keeps legal systems together and what somehow separates them. First of all, uh, I've repeated this many times, first point is history. Uh, there's a famous uh, saying that comparison involves history, and therefore, uh, if you don't know the history, you cannot compa compare. So if there are different, if there's a different historical development, uh, well, this different historical development can uh, generally lead um, to differences in legal systems. So legal systems are somehow the result of chance. I mean, just think of obviously the American legal system. Obviously, it is a fact of history. You know how these the colonies were set up and the role of these English colonies in the, in the, in America in North America and how they developed and what happened at a certain point in the 18th century and how at a certain point they broke away from, the, uh, from their motherland and became what the USA is today. So just, just to show you how history is a very powerful forger of, uh, of legal uh, systems. Uh, and also we should take into account the fact that if two countries are joined together for a lot of time, this sometimes uh, can lead to uh, natural transplants of models. So if one country is uh, tied to another country for a long time, well, it is it's quite common that the legal models are transplanted from one part of from one country to another country. Unification, even if afterwards these countries are separated, well means that these parts, these countries that have been joined together for a long time, they can uh, somehow bring to transplants of models. It much, it's much easier to transplant models, which is not always the case. I mean, we, we see, for example, in the case of the Austrian uh, Hungarian Empire, where for a long time Austria and Hungary were together, well, then, so they had different views on certain aspects, especially private law, and sort of they organized themselves differently. Or just let's think of Great Britain and the difference between England and Scotland. The fact that there's an act of settlement that joins, uh, somehow joins, joined, uh, joined Scotland to, uh, to, uh, to, England uh, from 
dynastic point of view in the uh, a very early 18th century, well, that has not prevented the sort of the sort of the Scotland from having its own uh, way of maintaining its tradition of uh, how it organizes uh, uh, the law, especially when it comes to private law. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, we find that uh, uh, separation of countries does not always mean a separation end of legal similarities. We find in Europe many countries that were united and were separated, and they follow, they continue to follow the same, uh, the same uh, road. So just to point out that we have to sort of understand to what extent um, uh, the um, history can bring legal systems diverge uh, to diverging uh, roots, or instead the fact that the external events, historical events, does not change very much what is the legal system in itself. So again, history, one has to analyze history and understand if it, is it only, is it what is the substance of the history? Is it only a history of great events or is it a substantive change in, in the society? And when the, when the American colonies break up, well, that is a real change because from a very oligarchic a system, a British system where, English system where only really power was in few hands. And here we have this idea of democracy, which is, was the first democratic experiment that was, uh, that started then, brought to a significantly different point in organization from a, a public law, from a constitutional point of view. This shows that so we have to look at history and try to understand history in what exactly is happening. Then, second, sorry, if they change the slide. Second element I would like to point out is the point of language. Now, this um, is uh, um, Sometimes we don't understand uh, why uh, sort of certain legal terms, we use legal terms in a certain way, and the other person coming from a different country doesn't understand what we mean. Why is this? Because first of all, the law is, let's talk of Western legal tradition, is a linguistic convention. So there's agreement between us, when we pronounce a certain word, it means, has a certain meaning. And uh, our Western legal systems tend to be precise uh, because we do not like ambiguity. If I say I'm selling, I means I'm selling. That means I'm transferring property from I'm the owner to someone else, and that is a transfer of property. But it's not something else. It's not some kind of other institution. It is not surely renting something out. It is not sort of selling, but having holding some kind of uh, of line on the uh, object so I can retrieve it. I can have it back. So just to show you how words are so important in the uh, in the law and for us Westerners. So, as it is a legal convention, and we, when we pronounce it, we say constitution, well, more or less we understand, maybe our British students, maybe somehow, uh, sort of they, their view of constitution is different from what other students, the other students of the class have of an idea of constitution. But if you go to the US student, or you go to a German student, a Spanish student, a Greek student, well, or a Brazilian student, when we say constitution, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about written text, which is at the pinnacle of the legal system. So there's no doubt about that. So we very clear that words have a very precise meaning. So if we change language, 
thing. And therefore, the words that are used, well, they can be uh, significantly different. I mean, a typical example, I've already made this example, when we talk of property in English, in English law, it means something. When we talk of property, instead, proprietà, 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 I again come from German. It means something different, significantly different. So, I mean, the, the roots of the word are the same, but the convention, the, legal, the convention behind the linguistic convention behind that word is significantly different. You take a handbook in property law, English uh, property law, and you see that you read that and you don't understand. What, what are they talking about? While if you take a handbook, if you come from the uh, European continent, while if we take, uh, whether it is a handbook that a German student is studying, a Spanish student is studying, a Greek student is studying, and we find there'll be a chapter devoted to property and, well, it's more or less the same. So even if we sort of, the, the sort of because there's a convention around certain words, and those words mean, have a certain legal, very precise legal meaning. And if we don't know that legal meaning, we don't, when we take the exam in sort of uh, private law and there's an exam, you know, they put us a question in property, obviously we must know the exact answer, otherwise we do not pass the exam. So this shows us how important words and the, the, what the meaning of a word is uh, in, in, the, in the Western legal uh, tradition. So the fact that uh, languages are uh, very important is we can look at, I'll just make three examples. First of all, the fact that Roman law has had uh, credible diffusion in, in, uh, in the European continent uh, for the, from the fall of the Roman Empire until at least well into uh, into the 17th, uh, 18th century. Why is this? Because Latin was the language of uh, the sort of lawyers used Latin. Why? Because we find, found all the terms were in Latin and Latin was generally used in um, official documents. If we look at official documents, they're generally uh, written in Latin because Latin is, was the lingua franca of the Middle Ages. So uh, it was easy for uh, anybody who was working in, in the institutions to use legal Latin uh, terms because if they used uh, ancient Italian, French, Spanish, German term, it would have been a great confusion. They would have not understood each other. Why was well, very clear that using Latin, it meant what the convention about Latin meant. Everybody had gone to university, had studied, uh, had studied law in Latin on Latin books, and therefore uh, they knew what they what they were meaning. So, just to show that how Roman law goes uh, uh, circulates in the Middle Ages, thanks to Latin, which was not only a language of uh, of uh, the institutions and of lawyers, but also uh, also in a whole lot of um, early uh, early uh, literature eh, is in Latin, and we find a whole lot of uh, of writers until uh, even signed in other fields that were writing in Latin well until well into the in well into the uh, 18th century, 17th 17th century. Uh, we find a whole lot of scientific writers who are writing in Latin. Why? Because it was, it was, uh, it was uh, everybody understood Latin. So you understand that this is one of the vehicles for which Roman law passed in uh, most of continental Europe. Or just let's look at the, how the, uh, uh, the Napoleonic codes we saw yesterday, the five famous codes, civil code, the commercial code, uh, the criminal code, and then the codes of procedure. Uh, well, why were they so immediately imitated around, uh, around Europe and in 
Latin America, because uh, French in the 19th century was the lingua franca. Everybody spoke French. They were supposed to, English arrived much later until the mid 20th century, the international language was French. Everybody spoke French. So it's uh, uh, obviously, if you have a legal text and written pretty well, because especially uh, if we look at the civil code, the civil code is written in a very literary form. Many, some points are not so precise, but the style is wonderful. Style is very clear, uh, according to following very, uh, uh, very strict rules of French expression. Ce qui n'est pas clair n'est pas français. What is, isn't clear isn't French. So the whole idea is that um, um, the, 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 if French is the lingua franca of the world, the world I knew in the 19th century, obviously you have very important legal texts where well, they circulate and they're copied, imitated, translated, and so on. We find the Napoleonic Civil Code translated in well, in all European languages and obviously in Spanish and covering a whole lot of, of Latin America, just to show you that how important language is in, uh, for us lawyers. And today, uh, well, uh, English is, uh, uh, well, the common law is obviously, is it, is it that the US and England are kept together because way back two centuries and uh, uh, 250 more or less, nearly 50 years ago, the, 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 the US were uh, uh, an English colony now. Come on, it isn't so, I mean, yes, there are some traditions that are kept. It's the language that keeps them together. It's the language that keeps together the fact that the, uh, American lawyers understand clearly what English lawyers are saying, they exchange, they understand. They, um, English lawyers generally are um, familiar with other languages, especially the, with this Latin and French, but American lawyers are much less sort of uh, uh, linguistically versatile. They speak English and that's it. Uh, so, I mean, but they, when you have um, text, books, uh, decisions which are in the same language, obviously you read them very easily. So what happens is that if there's a decision by uh, the UK Supreme Court, which is important after now with our, with our digital uh, instruments, well, they are, it's immediately after one hour, it's already read around the whole English world. And all those who are, um, who, um, who understand English. So uh, the fact that now uh, English is the lingua franca, and this is why we're using English in this class, not because we want to uh, teach English law. But we, it is a lingua franca, which uh, whether you are in Japan or in Brazil, you will be using this language, this lingua franca, although it is not your mother tongue, uh, well, this means that the English, certain uh, concepts, certain ideas, which are typical of the legal uh, environment, of the legal, uh, of English legal systems, American uh, English legal systems, are somehow uh, transplanted, circulated and transplanted around the world. Why? Because language brings these terms around, makes it uh, certain terms are used uh, indifferently in all around the world. And so we agree that when we are calling this, let's just make an example that we saw a few lessons ago, performance bond. Uh, well, this is performance bond. Anybody around the world knows what a performance bond is. It's expressed in English. You can find, obviously you could find uh, some, kind of, uh, um, some kind of expression uh, which is, uh, uh, somehow similar, which gives this idea in the local language, garanzia prima richiesta. This is the translation, the legal translation of performance bond. But we use performance bond because we know what we what we are talking about, and we obviously we will 
find a whole lot of terminology, of legal terminology, which moves around the world, whatever the country, through the fact that it's England, English is a language that is known, easily understood, and that it's easy to create a convention, um, a, a, a linguistic convention over um, a certain a, a certain terminology. So just to point out that this again is language is very important when we try to look at how to organize legal systems and how the um, how legal ideas move and enter uh, and are transported from one country to another and make the legal system somehow similar in certain aspects. Further aspect I wanted to point out is the role of philosophy. Now you've been studying, you're studying, I can remember, are you studying philosophy this, no, last semester you studied philosophy of war and uh, obviously you saw the very, well, Italian students clearly, the very strong relation that there is between uh, philosophy and, uh, and uh, uh, the law. Why? Because the law is an intellectual product. Like any intellectual product, it is uh, influenced by uh, philosophical ideas, especially if the, those who produce the, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, the law are a relatively limited uh, group. I mean, now it's much wider, but if you think of how it, um, the legal uh, sort of profession and the legal professionals, those who were there writing um, pieces of law, legislative instruments, or other kinds of, well, of decisions in the court, the fact that they had more or less the same education, the same background, and the same ideas at the back of their head, which are not necessarily legal ideas, this obviously influences the way one writes the law. Law is not something that is an ivory tower, but it is um, somehow very strongly related to, um, very strongly related to, um, to philosophical ideas which are dominant in a certain moment. Lawyers live in society and therefore are influenced by what goes around and what circulates in their moment. Here we have quite a nice list of examples. For example, for just think of uh, codification, how codification is the result of rationalism, Descartes, the René Descartes, and enlightenment this idea of universality of general principles of, of, uh, uh, that are valid under whatever sky, under whatever sun, these principles are valid. And then this is the 18th century, so it brings to the result of codification, while instead, as soon as the uh, philosophical mood changes and we see Hegel and, uh, and uh, German idealism, well, this brings to a shift in sort of the way we interpret the law, at least in continental Europe, with this idea of conceptual jurisprudence, the idea that sort of the, uh, the uh, legal system is more or less like a um, uh, philosophical uh, system, and there are some um, principles, philosophical principles of understanding that are set, and therefore the whole system must uh, somehow follow those philosophical principles. Now, this is typical of German idealistic philosophy. Uh, those of you who have studied Hegel uh, know that this is a very, uh, very precise and very rigorous, like most German things are, way of approaching, of shaping and understanding the mind. While in the uh, end of the 19th century, we find, especially in France, but not only in France, this positivistic attitude. So oh, this idea that use uh, positum, we would use the Latin expression, the law that is 
set, and that is the law, is what is written, black letter, black letter uh, uh, rule, which is written on a piece of paper, it is an act of parliament, that is the law. We're not interested in what the courts say and so on. So positivistic attitude and so on. What is written in the law changes society. So this is again an attitude, a philosophical attitude in which the sort of what is, uh, what is uh, set and set by authority somehow shapes society. And then we look at instead of uh, uh, what we would call experimentalist uh, philosophy, uh, the fact that sort of the philosophy is uh, you have to discover and you have to look at the society, you understand, to understand the world, you have to experiment it, you cannot have uh, ideas, preconceptions, but you must verify the notions you have and if you don't verify them, obviously you will not, you do not understand the world. This brings in the US to this uh, idea of the so-called legal realism. Uh, which is a very important uh, um, uh, philosophical and legal uh, tendency which has shaped, uh, well, American law for at least nearly one century. Now it's moving out of it, but at least one century has influenced very much the US uh, legal system. So just to point out that um, it is, uh, um, uh, we have to, Keep in mind, uh, we have to keep in mind the role of, uh, of philosophy. But philosophy is not the only uh, external um, element that influences legal systems. Uh, just to point out that here we see that the, the, one of the main differences between the American legal thought and continental uh, legal thought is the American legal thought is mostly experimentalist, not only. Uh, while continental European is much less um, sort of favorable and much less influenced in general to this kind of experimentalist uh, philosophy. So just to show, and this has profound influences on the way uh, continental European lawyers think and American lawyers think. Just to point out that obviously when they have to solve a problem, they will solve it in what is felt the most appropriate way, but the way that they reach that kind of solution, well, it can be a different, uh, it can be a different way, following different intellectual paths. So just to show you that, uh, again, if we want to look at the legal system, well, let's look at, well, the history, let's look at language, but also let's look at philosophy. Uh, and this is why I think quite rightly in Italian universities, not only Italian universities, uh, law students study also philosophy of law because it gives them a perspective, a much broader perspective of what the legal system is. Now, uh, there are still um, more aspects I'd like to analyze, but I wanted to ask if they are, again, Any questions? Legal realism, ha, ah, that's it. Shabadi has a very good question. What is legal realism? Now, uh, legal realism is a philosophical, um, tendency uh, movement which is somehow we can uh, look at a um, couple of um, Carly Welling and Jerome Frank, just to mention a couple of very important lawyers. And then we can also consider a great, a, a great Scandinavian uh, philosopher. Scandinavia, Norway, and Sweden have produced lots of 
legal philosophers and uh, Al Frost. Uh, what is the what is legal realism? Legal realism is that the law is not what is written, but is how it is practiced. And how do you look at how it is practiced? First of all, you will see how is the law produced. We, general, continental Europeans, we will look at the output. We will look at the act which is voted by parliament, and we say this is the law. Uh, legal realism says, hey, let's see how was it produced. How did this piece of legislation come out? What were the what was the legal process that was behind? What were the interests that were pushing toward this piece of legislation? And what is uh, uh, and what is the public or the private interest that were fostered in this piece of legislation? So should, let's go and look at what is behind that piece of legislation. Let's try to understand this is a decision. Yes, okay, we find. Um, we find a whole lot of decisions when we're looking at the uh, US Supreme Court. Well, we are interested in understanding what are the ideas when they, the American uh, Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court justices decided in favor of segregation and or uh, uh, in favor of desegregation, what were the ideas? Where did these uh, US Supreme court justices come from? What was their background? What did they study? Or should we look at uh, sort of the, how society works? We mustn't only look at what happens in the courts. In the courts, is, there are people of power. Let's look how, um, how uh, people generally conform to certain rules. We look at social norms. We also look at contracts. Let's look at contracts which are not challenged, how they work, and how uh, the, mm, the system, um, uh, the, the economic system works through contracts. So legal realism means that you're looking at the reality. You're not looking at preconcepts. You're looking at somehow how things are, you think things are, uh, are really there and really happening. So it is, um, it is somehow, um, Legal realism is uh, uh, obviously um, for us, uh, continental European, it's mind opening because we see, hey, this is great. Because there's a whole lot of, uh, we look at the facts, we look at society, how society works, and what is the role that the law plays in society. While in continental European systems, well, we look at the law as something not sacred, but something which is somehow. Uh, removed from society and somehow it imposes itself on society. So legal realism is a way of looking at the legal system and interpreting the legal system clearly, and we shall see it in a moment, it, uh, we see it the next week, it has, it borders a lot with sociology. So you don't, sometimes you say, hey, but you're not a lawyer, you really are a sociologist. You're trying to understand, look at statistics. You're trying to understand uh, you're not trying to understand what uh, what is the real essence of uh, uh, a legal institute is, but you're interested to see what are the how much this legal institute is applied or not applied. What is its influence on the economy or on society? So clearly, we are looking at uh, divorce. Well, we look at the rules of divorce. We don't know how many divorces are they. How do they, how are they settled? Uh, what are the main agreements in the divorce agreement, the main clauses in the divorce agreement? So looking very much at reality, that is why we call it the, um, um, uh, um, we call it a realist, uh, uh, realist, uh, um, uh, legal realism. Now, uh, Zina is asking experimentalist philosophy. Now, um, we can say that, uh, uh, well, we find the first push in this direction by René Descartes, who says, well, uh, we have to prove everything we say. But Descartes remains 
very much on I, uh, on ideal platform, what we see is very much related to uh, scientific philosophy, philosophy of science, Galileo Galilei, Newton, just to make a couple of names. So the idea that you have to experiment, you must see if you have a theory, you must experiment it, and you mustn't experiment it from a logical point of view. You must experiment it from uh, a practical uh, point of view. You see how it actually works. Here we have uh, we have a uh, few names. Obviously, the main name is Hume, a great English philosopher. It gives us uh, um, René Descartes. Sorry, is René Adimari is asking René Descartes is what we call in Italian Cartesio, but his French is René Descartes. Uh, um, so uh, Hume, which is a typical, he's a typical example of uh, a great 18th century philosopher, English philosopher, who somehow um, brings out this idea that you have must experiment it. And uh, very interesting, Hume has done um, sort of how basic, many basic studies on education, on, uh, on how, the, how children grow up, how they understand. So development of intelligence, of understanding. Uh, so this is the first step, I would say, Hume is the first step. And then if we look at great uh, American, which are, they're not sort of, say, they, we would call them maybe they're more social scientists, but we, if, if we look at, if we have a global view of philosophy, we don't say that philosophy is only someone who is uh, um, sort of uh, some, uh, some absent-minded person like Immanuel Kant, who goes out of his uh, very regular and goes around Königsberg and was at the same time taking a walk. But we have a rather broad idea of who a philosopher is. Here, I just suggest if you're interested in the development of social sciences in, Pierce, Huey, these are two great social scientists which are somehow experimentalists. Experimentalist means that you must, so you must test your theories. Especially if you're doing a social series, you must look at numbers, behaviors, and so on. So this has very much to do with sociology, but it's also a view of how you organize, you organize the, uh, you organize the way of thinking. You is the inventor of a, a system of classification in libraries. If you go to most libraries, you see that uh, the system is a Dewey system, which is uh, has many flaws because obviously Dewey was American and therefore organized knowledge in a certain way. But you clearly see that it is experimentalist. You want to see how things work in practice. You don't want to only say very nice things, very great ideas, and then they are not. Uh, they don't. They have no uh, practical. Um, confirmation. So just to point out that this is, uh, um, this, is um, uh, this is very important when we look at uh, um, these great uh, social, we would call them social scientists, American social scientists, which lived mostly uh, sort, of a, um, sort of first half work, the most, first half of, of the 20th century. Well, we see that they, they gave but they shaped a lot the whole idea of philosophy, which is uh, uh, looking very much at, uh, um, at uh, um, conceptual principles, values, but also verifying to what extent these principles and these values are actually present in a certain, in a certain society. So just to point out that this is, um, uh, let's see, they are, sorry, just to see. That was Zinai, Shabadi. Any, any more questions on this point?
apparently not. Um, I trust, I repeat, our Italian students have received uh, the instructions for the exam. I will be sending our Erasmus students the instructions today or tomorrow. Uh, they are very similar, but uh, there are some slight differences. Uh, but um, uh, obviously, uh, I will expect that if you have any any questions, uh, well, put these questions to me today. Or if you were, just want to send me an email, and obviously, if the if the the issue is of general interest, I will obviously send a reply to everybody. So everybody, so if someone puts a question that is which I find is of general interest, uh, clarification. Obviously, I will answer um, uh, answer not only to the person who has the student who has put the question, but also to all the rest of the class. So it's very important. So have a look at the at those uh, that short present the short. Uh, instructions that I sent you, and then uh, obviously, the, well, we have time, still time to uh, to um, to answer. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Yes. Who is speaking? Uh, Mari. Yes. I have a question about the um, uh, Islamic legal system. Uh, you said that uh, uh, in the Islamic legal system, um, they are not ruled only by um, the Sharia, what is contained about, uh, in uh, the sh Sharia part of the Quran. Uh, but it's a mix. Uh, I didn't get well, what is the other part. Now, uh, let's, first of all, uh, Islamic legal system, I mean, it's just as if we were talking of Roman, Roman law. Clearly, we find Roman law in Germany, in Spain, in Italy. Uh, but uh, it isn't that Roman law governs Italy or governs France, Germany, or Spain. Uh, we have elements of Roman law within our legal systems and a tradition that is brought ahead, but it is only part of the legal system. If you want to organize, we're looking, first of all, it makes no sense. If we're talking of religion, then it's clear we are interested in comparing religions, so we are interested in comparing the free monotheistic religions, and then we will compare them. But if we're looking at the legal system from a Western point of view, first of all, we're looking at states. So we are interested, and, and we know very well that Algeria is not Bangladesh. Obviously, the majority of population in Algeria and Bangladesh are uh, Muslim, but doesn't, that doesn't mean that the legal system in Bangladesh is the same as the legal system in in uh, in Algeria. So first of all, let's look at states and let's understand how a state organizes its legal system. Just think you are an Algerian student and you have to present the Algerian legal system. Obviously you will find a whole lot of aspects, mostly in family law and some in sort of property and contract, mostly private law, few in criminal law, that are somehow regulated by the Sharia. But for the rest, uh, I just made a silly example of uh, traffic circulation, uh, banking system, obviously you will find certain aspects, the fact that in the, in the Quran, just like in, in so until the well, 16th century in, in Roman Catholic, well, you can't, you couldn't lend money with an interest, but apart from this fact, the specific fact, you would obviously regulate, the, you would regulate the banking system in a certain way, or telecommunications, or if you have, a, if you have a contract to build a house, obviously it isn't the Sharia. You're not going to find the rules of building when you have a contract with someone who must build your house, whether you are in. In, in Algeria, Bangladesh, or you are in Germany, it's a contract between the owner, uh, the person who is, has uh, asked to build a house and the constructor, that's it. So there's no Sharia in that, there's no religious principle in that. How the house must be built, how it is going to be, the price is going to be paid and so on. So just to point out that we, 
when we look at legal systems, uh, the fact that there's religion, it's just if, if I come from, and my name is uh, uh, Muhammad bin Garub, and I come from Saudi Arabia, and I come suddenly, I come over across the Mediterranean, and I see well, Europe and say, hey, Europe is Christian, and start looking on the gospel and in the Bible, and I try to understand what is the legal system in Europe, simply because in Europe the majority of the population is Christian. It makes, obviously, we are much more secular than in other countries. But the fact that there is a religion, and religion is important, we've seen, remember the slides we saw how important religion still is in family law, in ethical issues, in sort of uh, some social aspects of well, equality between. Uh, between men and women, the fact of how marriage, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and so on, well, it surely has an end, end of life, beginning of life uh, issues, surely has importance. But the legal system is somehow built differently. So let's look at the country, not say just simply, oh, but as Islam. Islam is, well, um, over one billion uh, followers. Uh, I tell you, from the Philippines, China, Philippines, way down to Mauritania, and from uh, from Zanzibar to um, to Sarajevo. Well, I mean, huge expansion, and plus Central uh, Central Asians. So, I mean, is that the criteria? Shall we sort of say that all these countries, Tajikistan and Mauritania, and uh, uh, sort of Niger and uh, Bosnia Herzegovina are on the same uh, or uh, have the same legal system. Obviously not. So just to keep in mind, uh, in from our Western idea, religion is very important. It gives a whole lot of rules, more or less, in a certain system, but it is not the only source of the law in whatever. Even if you go to sort of the Islamic. Uh, Republic of Iran, which is surely the most sort of solid and staunch defender of the faith, also because it's a Shia, a Muslim Shia country. Well, uh, obviously, the, the, the religion has a very important role in politics, in the constitution, and in certain private law aspects, but many other aspects are completely, when it comes to oil trade, obviously, the oil trade is not regulated by Iran is not regulated by the Sharia, just to make sort of the main source of wealth, of economic wealth, of GDP of Iran is not surely regulated by, uh, by the Sharia. Just to show you, the, so let's, let's not think that that is just the Sharia. Islamic law is wherever that, there's Islam, there's Islamic law. Well, <laughs> you know what Azerbaijan, you would see the interpretation where the majority of population is, is Muslim, well, you won't really see much of what you see instead of Saudi Arabia. Muslim here, Muslim there, and two very different organizations of society. Other questions? If there are no more questions, we can stop our lesson today, but please, those who joined the lesson after five past five, just put a, uh, message post a message on the chat so I know who is here and we shall reconvene on Monday next week we'll finish the we'll finish the class as I've already mentioned. Good afternoon to everybody.